Hello, welcome to Chapter 9, our chapter on social influence. We'll answer the question, how do we influence and become influenced by others? In this chapter, we'll cover three main themes. The first is conformity, or how and why is it that we match our behaviors to the behaviors of others. The second is compliance, what causes us to agree to the requests of others. And the third is obedience to authority, or what makes us uh, obey what we're directed to do by authority figures, even especially if those things are against our better judgment. Um, during this assignment, there will be three points at which you'll be answering questions, and your answers will serve as your in-class participation points for this week. So, uh, mimicry. We copy the behaviors and facial expression of others in our, in our heads and in our behaviors. You can see that this starts at a very young age. The mother gets the baby to open its mouth for the food by opening her own mouth, and the baby naturally mimics. Um, you can see this happening with this very young infant. You can see this happening with an older infant, and this is a behavior that we don't change. We continue to mimic others. Um, so our mirror neurons, our neurons in our brain, and we're gonna watch a little video about those, and they explain in our brain how it is that we can feel the experience of others even if we don't actually do it. So um, these are the mechanisms in our brains that allow us to mimic those behaviors. And we'll talk about automatic mimicry and how it is that we actually um, mirror others' facial expressions. And a fine example that you'll see in a moment is people who are watching a movie um, actually taking on the facial expressions of the movie characters having the experience. So with that, we're going to take a pause and watch this 14-minute video on mirror neurons. And this will help explain this process of mimicry. And Hello again. Hello again. Gaze, Gaze into, into a mirror, mirror and, and what do you see? Well, well I, see I see my face, face of, course. of course. But in, but my, in my face, face I, see I see moods, I see shifts, shifts of feeling. Of feeling. We humans, we humans are really, really good, good at reading faces, faces and, and bodies, because if, if I can, I can look, look at you, you and feel what you're, what you're feeling, feeling, I can, I can learn, learn from you, from you connect, connect to you, I can love, I can love you. you. Empathy, Empathy is one of our finer, finer traits, and when it happens, it happens, it happens, it happens so, so easily. easily. Perhaps, Perhaps because, because this, is this is brand new science, science. This, this is just out of the lab. lab. We may we have, have some special circuitry in our brains that helps us whenever we look at each other. Ask yourself, why, why do people get so involved, so, involved, so, so deeply, deeply, deeply involved with such anguish, anguish such pain, pain, such the 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 we can lose it completely, completely at, the at the movies, at the video games, games. Watching, watching the dance. dance. Is, Is there, there something about, about humans, humans, humans particularly, particularly, that allows, allows us to us connect, connect so deeply, deeply when, we when we watch, watch other, people. other people? Watch, watch them moving, moving. Watch, watch them playing, playing. Watch, watch their faces. faces. Well, well, as it happens, happens scientists, scientists have, have an explanation, an explanation for, this for this strange ability, ability to connect. To connect. It's, it's new. new. It's never it's been, been found, found on the cellular, cellular level, level before. A set of brain cells found, found on either side, side of, the of the head. Among all, all the billions, billions of long branching cells, cells in our brain, brain these so-called so -called mirror, mirror neurons, neurons have surprising power. power. What we found is the mechanism that underlies something which is absolutely fundamental to the way that we see other people in the world. And it began, and it began entirely, entirely by accident, by accident. At, a at a laboratory in a lovely old city, city of Parma, Italy, 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 where a group, a group of brain researchers, researchers was working with monkeys. monkeys. And they were and testing the neurons, neurons, a brain cell, cell that, that always fired, fired this, this sound, sound. Yeah. Whenever, whenever the monkey, the monkey would grab, grab for a peanut. So the lab had all these peanuts, peanuts around, around. And, whenever and whenever the monkey made its move, the neuron would fire. Scientists thought, now here's a neuron that is essential to motion, it's a motor neuron. 
Then, then one day, one the, day monkey the monkey was just, was just sitting, sitting around, around, not moving at all, all just, just sitting. Sit. When a human, when a human scientist, scientist came into the lab, and when that scientist, scientist grasped, grasped the peanut, the, peanut yeah, yeah. The, the monkey cell fired. fired. Now, now, the, the monkey, monkey had, moved. had moved. It was the it human, human that moved. moved. Suggesting, Suggesting that this neuron up here couldn't tell the difference between seeing something and doing something. Seeing and doing were the same. Or more intriguing, that for this neuron, watching somebody do something is just like doing it yourself. The head of the lab, Jacqueline Lucky said, the same, the same one new one new fire gold. gold. When the monkey observes something, something, and one monkey's, monkey's doing something, it's almost, it's almost unbelievable. unbelievable. It was surprising, it was surprising because, because this, this cell which was involved in much of the monkey, the monkey turned out, turned to, be out to be interested in, in the, movements the movements of other, of other people, people as well. As well. Some people, Some people call the call monkey, monkey see monkey, monkey do neurons, neurons, but the name, but the name of the stuff, stuff is mirror neurons, 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 because with them, because them the, brain the brain seems to mirror, to mirror the, movements the movements it sees. It sees. This accidental this discovery got scientists, scientists thinking, thinking, thinking doing more doing tests, tests and it seems pretty clear that this is, not, this is not, just not just a monkey thing, thing. It's, a people it's a people thing too. too. We all we know, know that humans learn by looking and copying, that's what infants do. First you look, look. You do. You do. Ready? Let's see you beat this way. This way. And once and you've watched, watched and, copied and copied and learned, and learned a set of, a set of you moves, you not only have your head. Your head. Look, you put your shoes on. If you see, if you somebody, see somebody else, else doing, doing it, you can you share, share the experience. The experience. They, know they know the moves, the moves you know the moves, so you can move with them. With them. If you can, if you use, can the use the years of training that you yourself have done, learning to crawl, then learning to walk, then learning to eat, this is, this is an incredibly rich, rich set, of set of knowledge that you could, that you could apply, apply to the to problem, problem of actually, of actually seeing, seeing what's, going what's going on. Going on. <laughs> So that's so why that's when why I head down, down the street the carrying, street, carrying all, all these packages, packages, not only do people, people watch, watch, look how, how they're, they're watching. watching. They, they feel, feel my predicament. Because they know what it's like, like to, carry to carry heavy packages. packages. They all they know about carrying. Carry. So as so they, as they as watch me they can feel themselves moving. Their neurons are mirroring the action. The mirror system is the way that you tap into, the way that you harness your own abilities and project them out into the world. And people are really good at watching and translating what we see. Like with just 13 moving dots, that's all there are here. You'll have no You'll trouble, have no trouble recognizing, recognizing these uh, very ordinary, very ordinary activities. activities. What's more, What's tests, more have tests have shown when a person, when a person sees a movie like this as his own movement, he'll recognize it immediately as, as his own. And that's, and that's why, why sports fans tense with, with the action and release and leap. Because if you if know, you know the, game, the game, Your neurons, your neurons are firing, are firing as if it's you playing, playing, giving a whole new meaning to the phrase armchair quarterback. quarterback. That's why That's it's why so easy to be a sports fan. But there, but there is more, is more suggests, suggests UCLA, UCLA professor, professor Marco Iacoboni. He, he thinks mirror neurons tie us not just, not just to other people's actions, actions but to but other people's feelings. So the idea so was, idea was to try to figure, to figure out, out how the emotional system and the system and system and system system are connected together. together. To, demonstrate, to demonstrate, he put, he put me into, put this, into this very powerful, powerful FMRI, FMRI brain, brain scanner, scanner that can that peer into, into the brain, the brain while, while it's working. It's working. And he gave me he some gave goggles, goggles so he could show me pictures when I was in it. So you can so see the eyeball, the brother. brother. And once and he once had a good view into, into my brain, my brain. Nice, looking nice looking brain. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, you're not you're supposed, supposed to talk when you're scanning, all right? Sorry, sorry. Then he said, then he said okay, okay, I'm going to show you a bunch of faces. And for each face, I want you to imitate it. So I did that. Then he recorded, he recorded my, brain my brain while I moved, while I moved my, facial my facial muscles. muscles. Okay. Then he said, then he okay, said, okay, same faces, but this, this time, don't, don't, don't move a muscle, a muscle. Just, look. just look. So I looked. So I looked. When we, when checked, we the checked the results, 
Oh, there's my brain. There's my brain. I've never I've seen never my brain before. Yakaboni says part of my brain that's working, that's working when, when I think, think of things, things, the same, the same part, part gets busy, gets busy when, I when I see the face. The face. Plus, when, Plus, when I was when looking, I was at, looking these at these faces, faces, faces I remember, I remember feeling, feeling extra uncomfortable, kind of bad. But when these faces came on, I don't know, I felt better and almost happy. And in fact, and in at, fact the at the moment I was looking, I was looking at the happy, happy things, things, my brain, this is my this brain, is my that, brain. Instant that instant to the red, the red area, area here, here, it shows, it shows activity, activity in the happy, happy emotional, emotional part, part of my brain. Of my brain. And when I was when imitating the happy things, it looked like an even bigger response. response. This is Yakaboni's inconsistent result. Mirror neurons he believes can send messages to the limbic or emotional system in our brains. So it's possible these neurons help us tune in to each other's feelings. That's empathy. Stronger than that, you will find that it allows people to actually connect at a very simple level. You're saying there's a place in my brain which, which job job it is, it is to, to live in live other people's, other people's minds, minds, live in other people's, other people's bodies. bodies. That's right. That's right. Oh, down, down. I've got to die. Don't have to die. Don't have to die. Don't have to die. And great and actors, actors instinctively, instinctively know, know that if they that put, they put feeling, feeling and drama, and drama into, into their bodies... Their bodies oh, my God. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Their faces, we, we will respond. Will respond. <laughs> what actors, actors are experts in is using, is using their moves to inspire, to inspire feelings, feelings in the people watching. Watch. These are the These experts, are the experts in, the in the nervous system. We are intensely social, social creatures. creatures. We literally we read other people's, people's minds. Mind. I don't mean I don't anything mean psychic, psychic like telepathy. telepathy. But you can, but you can adopt, adopt another person's, another person's point, of point of view. When you put when it together, what do you think it's going to be? So if so mirror neurons help us connect to emotion, what about people who have trouble with this? Kids like Christian who have autism. Why do you like Legos? It's been it's known, been for, known some for some time that children, children with autism could be quite, could be intelligent, quite intelligent, but but have a profound, profound deficit, deficit in social, social interaction. Social interaction. Christian, Christian can speak, speak and read and, read and write, and write. But, like but like many kids, kids with autism, with autism he, will he will avoid eye contact. Eye contact. He, often he often misunderstands, misunderstands questions. questions. So Christian, so Christian can you tell me what you did in school today? Doing well. You're doing well? Everybody, Everybody wants, wants to, know to know what exactly, what exactly causes, causes this. this. So Dr. So Ramachandran and his graduate, graduate students, students in Z-Shank design, design an experiment. experiment. So we're going to be reading, we're your, reading your brainwaves with this cat. cat. They recorded record brainwaves, brainwaves while the kids, while the kids opened, opened and closed their, closed their hands. And while they, they looked at a movie of somebody else's hands. hands. For most For people, the brainwaves look the same either way, whether they're doing or seeing. But for kids, for with, kids autism, with autism, the wave, the wave changes. changes. Suggesting, Suggesting possible that autism, that autism may have something, have something to do with broken, with broken mirror, neurons. mirror neurons. Their brains their brain may, may indeed be different in different that regard, regard, and they may and have, have deficits in the neuron system. system. But, but we don't know this don't for know sure yet. Yeah, 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 additional work needs to be done using brain imaging. But what we do know, says Ramachandran, is that healthy human beings are intensely social. More than More our cousins, than our cousins the, monkeys, the monkeys, we invent, we invent ways, ways to, connect. to connect. We invent we dances, dances and, handshakes, and handshakes and games, and games to, play. to play. We eat, we together, eat together, we meet, we meet and, and we talk. We talk, we talk, we talk. Get away, get away, get away. Everybody, everybody, this question, this question. What makes what humans makes unique? unique? What makes, what makes different, different from the great apes, for example? example. That you can, you say, can say humor, humor or the laughing, or laughing biped. biped. Language, Language, certainly. certainly. Okay. But, but another thing another is thing culture. culture. And a lot, and a lot of, culture of culture comes from, comes from imitation. imitation. Watching, Watching your teachers, your teachers do, something. do something. And here, and here B.S. Ramachandran makes, makes a big leap. leap. He has, he has proposed that at a key, a key moment, moment in our evolution, our evolution his guess, his guess, our mirror neurons, neurons got better. better. And that and made that all the difference, all the difference he because, because once we humans, humans got, got better, better at learning, learning from each from other, other looking, looking, copying, copying teaching, teaching, we could do, we could things, do things the other the creatures, other creatures couldn't. couldn't. In other words, in other words if, you if you are a bear, bear and suddenly your environment turns cold, you need a few million years to develop... Polar bear, polar bear type, type layers, of, layers fat of fat and fur. And fur. 
It would take, it would take many, 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 many bear, bear generations, generations to select, to select a furrier bear. bear. But, but, says Ramachandran, says Ramachandran, Ramachandran if you're a human, you're a human watch, you your watch your father slay some of the bear, bear and, and putting, putting on, on fur coat, fur coat. You know, skinning, skinning it, it, using gold coat. coat. You watch you it, watch it you, learn you learn it instantly. Instant. Your mirror your neurons are firing, firing away in your brain. In your brain. And you perform and the perform same sequence, complicated sequence. Instead of going through millions and millions of evolution, you've done it in one, one generation. generation. And while no and one's while claiming, claiming that mirror neurons, neurons are the key ingredient, ingredient that makes us that makes different, us different, from, different other from other features, features. What, these what these neurons, neurons do suggest about, about us seems almost, seems almost self-evident. Self -evident. You can see in any something at a sports bar that deep in our architecture, down in ourselves, we are built to be together. There will be, be very little point in having a nervous system, system if you lived on, you your, lived own. on your own. There will be a lot of point in having a digestive system if you lived on your own. There will be a good point in having a movement system if you lived on your own. There will be a good point in having a visual system if you lived on your own. But there will be no point in having a mirror system. Mirror system. The mirror system, mirror system is the most the basic, basic social, social brain system. Brain system. It's a brain system which there's no point in having if you don't want to interact or relate to other people. But we do but we like, do to, like to act, and maybe, maybe now, now, as never, as before, never before, we will understand, we will understand why. why. Okay. So, I will pull our content back up and apologize to you. I'm recording this, and there's construction going on outside, and I, I hope that it's not disturbing you. So, let's pull this back up again. Um, so, uh, this, the... A excellent video talked about mirror neurons, the mechanisms in our brain that cause us to mimic and make it socially advantageous and then automatic mimicry. So the mirror neurons allow us to feel it even if we don't do it. And the automatic memory is the actual mimicking or the actual doing of a behavior. So is this good or bad? Well, we can say mostly it's good. It allows us to feel others' emotional states, anticipate their actions, empathize. It, it allows us to live together socially. In some ways, it's bad, too, because as we mimic others, it may lead to conformity or the tendency to go along with others, even in cases that violate our reason or our morals. Mm -hmm. So how do others' decisions affect us? Uh, the concept related to this is conformity. And you will see that it affects us um, similarly and differently. Uh, first off, um, we seek information from others, and the information that others have will influence us. Others can fill in the blanks when we're lacking adequate information. And this o informational social influence was explored, explored by Sharif in autokinetic movements. So what he was looking at is sort of an undetectable phenomenon or a light that appeared to move and, at, and he asked people how much did it move. And rather than me explain it to you, I'm going to show you the first half of this little video. And here we are. It's a subject it's a psychologist being investigated for the best, for the best part, of part of the century. In this video, In this video I, wanted I wanted to share a couple of the old pioneering studies in this area, this area. Plus, a plus a recent neurological, neurological study that offers surprising ideas, ideas on just, on just how, deep how deep they were affected, affected by group, by group opinion. opinion. I'll end I'll with, end some, with personal some personal observations and an invitation. And an invitation. In 1935, in his study, study of social influences, Sheriff made Sheriff use, made of, a use of a phenomenon called the autokinetic auto effect. effect. This is where a stationary, where a stationary point, point of light, light in a completely dark, dark room will appear to move. This happens, this happens because, because the eye makes tiny involuntary, involuntary movements, movements all the time. All the time. In a well-lit well well room, room with clear reference points, our brain compensates, compensates for these involuntary movements so that the world appears stationary. But in a totally dark room, we've got no frame of reference to tell our brain whether it's our eye that moves or the point of light. Sheriff asked Sheriff the individual, asked individual subject, subject to estimate, to estimate how, far how far the point of light moved. When asked when individually, asked individually the, range the range of answers given was, given was pretty broad. broad. Some consistently Some reported that the light, that the light moved, moved around six inches. inches. Others consistently, Others consistently reported, reported that it barely, barely moved, moved at all. At all. But when, but when asked, asked as a group, subject's answers converged towards, towards an average distance. Average distance. Subjects, subjects rejected, rejected the idea, the idea that they're being influenced, influenced by the group, but went on, went on in subsequent, subsequent individual, individual tests, tests to give answers consistently close to their group norm. Sheriff's experiment was criticized for using an ambiguous task. Not knowing for sure how far the light moved, subjects were more prone to change their minds. But what would happen if the task wasn't ambiguous? In the 1950s... Okay. And so, just briefly, that was a quick overview of Sharif's work 
And you can see that the fact that there was no correct answer to the question is what led Ash, and Ash is most famous for his studies in conformity, to do his work. As you're watching this, think about how people might react today. Ash addressed this question, question using, using very concrete, concrete stimuli. stimuli. He assembled, he assembled groups, groups of seven, seven colleagues college college in the classroom, classroom for an experiment, for an experiment ostensibly, ostensibly about visual judgment. judgment. He then presented, he then presented a, series a series of cards, of cards like, this. like this. Going around, Going the, around group, the group, participants, participants then had to identify, had to identify which, which of the lines, the lines on the right, right matched the line on the, the, line on the left. left. The twist was, the twist was that in reality, in reality, all the participants, all the participants except one, one were Confederates of Ash, who'd secretly been instructed to give the wrong answer on 12 out of 18 sets of cards, starting with the third set. Ash tested, Ash tested 123, 123 subjects. subjects. In normal, In normal circumstances, circumstances, subjects gave incorrect, gave incorrect answers, answers less than 1% of, of the time. With the social, With the social pressure, of the pressure of the Confederates applied, that shot that up shot to an incident of around 37%. With 74% of subjects, with 74 of subjects conforming to the majority, the majority on at least one critical, one critical trial. trial, subjects, subjects didn't, didn't necessarily go straight, straight away. Some started, Some started out to find a group for a couple of rounds. But became, but became gradually, gradually more hesitant, more hesitant quiet and quiet before conformity, before conformity eventually, kicked eventually kicked in. All right. And what we're going to do is um, take another look at this ASH experiment, um, because I thought that was a, that description is maybe a little bit hard to understand. So we'll take another look at that right in this video. And this is a simulation, so you'll see how this actually played out. So as you watch it here, think about how... But an experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces, as the experiment of Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task, Your task is a very, is a simple, very simple one. one. You're to look You're at the, look at the line, on the line on the left and determine, and determine which of the which three lines on the right, right is equal to, equal to it in length. length. All right, we'll, All right, proceed, we'll proceed in this order. In this order. You'll, give You'll give your answer. Only one of the people, people, people in the group is a real subject. Real subject. Now, fifth the fifth person with a white t-shirt. The others are Confederates of the experiment and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins unaventually as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. Three. 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 Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. But he found through interviews that they went along with the group for different reasons. One. 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 They must be right. Therefore, they are one of me. One. One. This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. One. 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 One, one, two, two, one, one, two, 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 two. I know they're wrong. What should I say? Two, two. In this case, the subject knows he is right, but goes along to avoid the discomfort of disagreeing with the group. Here, the distortion is at the level of his response. Two, 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 two. Two. In the previous, the previous experiment, experiment, the naive, the naive subject, subject stood alone, stood alone against, against the group. In this variation, Ash gave the naive, naive subject a partner, partner here seated, here seated in, the in the third position, position who also, who also gives the correct, the correct response. response. One. 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 Two. Two. With a partner, partner yielding drops to only 5% of the critical, critical trials, trials compared to 37% without, without a partner. partner. Although subjects so report warmth and good feeling toward the partner, they typically, they typically deny that he played a role in their own independent opinions. Independent the partnership, the partnership variation, variation shows that much of the power of the group came not from the partnership variation shows that much of the power of the group came not merely from its numbers, numbers but from the unanimity of its opposition. When that unanimity is punctured, the group's power is greatly reduced. Sometimes, Sometimes we go along, we go with, the along group with the group because, because what they say, they say convinces, convinces us they are right. They are right. This is called informational conformity. conformity. But sometimes, sometimes we conform because we are apprehensive that the group will disapprove or we are deviant. 
This is called, this is called normative, normative conformity. conformity. The strength, the strength of the normative, of the normative factor, factor is shown in another variation, variation carried out by Ash. By Ash. In this variation, the subject, the subject is told that because, because he had arrived, he arrived late, late, he would have he would to have write, write his, his answers. answers. Subjects, subjects in this private, private response, response experiment, experiment are exposed to the same, to the same amount of misleading information as other subjects, other subjects but they are but immune from any possible criticism by the group. One, 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 one. And this and enormous this limit is the pressure, pressure to conform. conform. Conformity drops by two-thirds. Ash's experiment is a classic. It reveals how people will deny what they see and submit to group pressure. It allows us not only to observe conformity, but to study the conditions that increase or reduce its occurrence. Okay. I thought that illustration was a little bit more helpful. We'll talk more about those conditions in a moment, um, but I'm just going to go a little bit further in this initial video before we do so. Ash proposed that proposed conformity, conformity could be explained, could be explained by, distortions by distortions occurring, occurring at any of any three, three levels, levels perception, perception, judgment, judgment and action. And action. Mm -hmm. At the, At the action level, level subjects believe the majority, the majority are, wrong, are wrong, but go along, go with along anyway. anyway. At the level, At the of, level judgment, of judgment, subjects perceive there is a, there conflict, is a conflict, but reject, but reject their, their own judgment, judgment including, including the majority, the majority are, right. are right. At the level, At the level of, perception, of perception, subjects perception, perception are, genuinely are genuinely distorted, distorted by, the by the majority answers. A recent a neurological, neurological study, study by Burns, by Burns and, colleagues and colleagues investigated, investigated these three explanations, explanations using, magnetic using magnetic resonance imaging, imaging to examine the brain, the brain activity, activity involved in this social, in this social phenomenon. phenomenon. 32, 32 subjects were tested, tested in all, and this and time this the task involved, involved mentally rotating 3D, 3D objects, objects to decide, to decide whether or not they matched. As with Ash's experiments, 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 the rest of the, the, rest group, of the group were confederates instructed to give predetermined right or wrong answers. Consistent, consistent with Ash's findings, findings, subjects on average average conform 41% of the time. But of course, but of course the main thrust of, of this experiment, this experiment was, to was to see what parts of the brain were associated with its conformity. If conformity, if conformity occurred, occurred at the level of perception, errors like the occipital, the occipital and parietal lobes used in visual, visual spatial awareness, awareness would be expected, expected to show activity. activity. If it occurred if it at the level of judgment and action, other areas would be predicted, such as the orbital frontal cortex, using decision making. The MRI, the MRI scans, scans showed, activity showed activity in the occipital, in the occipital right or network, network supporting, supporting the perception, the perception explanation. explanation. If it's true it's that true subjects' that perceptions, perceptions are genuinely, are genuinely distorted, distorted, that means, that that means that the group opinion, the group opinion has, the has the potential to affect an individual's individual information, information processing on a very, on a very profound, profound level. level. Now, I'd suggest, now, I'd suggest it's, not it's not possible to generalize these results back to Ash's subjects. Ash's subjects. subjects. I'd suggest, I'd suggest there's a substantial, there's a substantial difference, difference in difficulty, difficulty between, between the two tasks, tasks. So, that so that with the rotation, rotation task, subject, subject might well be more, well be more prone to rely on other people's judgments. To be sure, to the, be same sure the same brain processes are at work in Ash's experiment, experiment. Subjects, subjects would have to be tested, have to be tested doing his single, his single line, line task. task. And even and though even the though perception, perception explanation was supported, supported here, here, we know that we know the other two processes do exist. We can all think of instances in our lives when we've knowingly gone along with the majority despite private reservations or preferences. There are, there are loads of human, of human mechanisms, mechanisms that can work for us or, or, against, or against us. Our patent-seeking patent behavior has led to all... Okay, so uh, that is the basic conformity study, and we'll look at the rest of that video in a little bit. So um, the, the main thrust of it is Sharif used autokinetic movement, which is a movement that was no correct answer. It's just a perception, and individuals would converge and agree on one response um, in general. And then Ash did the conformity experiment, um, looking to see if people would conform to a group answer, even if they know the group is wrong. And um, they were further researchers were curious about whether that was um, about why this occurred, whether it was happening because of an actual perceptual distortion or it was because uh, of just conformity, but still retaining one's own perceptions. And their conclusion was a little flawed because it was based on a much more difficult task. So this is the chart that we just saw. We can look at these three reasons for which we might go along with the group. The first is that we might actually not trust our own perception. We might think we're wrong, so we're not aware of a conflict. We think the group is right, we must be wrong. Our own perception must be off. My example for this would be when I'm hiking, and I tend to get lost easily. And if I think we should go right, but the other members of my group, even if there's only one other member of my group, thinks that we should go left, I'll tend to defer because I have a lot of experience being wrong in my perception of that. And in that case, my parietal occipital region would be active um, because I'm, I am not trusting my own 
judgment in that matter. Um, if the distortion is at the level of judgment, then I would believe the group to be, I would be aware that my opinion differed from theirs, and I would think the group is right. Um, in this first case, I'm not aware that the group, I, I think that the group is right, but I'm not even aware of a difference. So in the second case, I, I shifted my perception here. In this case, it's at the judgment level. I'm aware that there's a difference, but I'm willing to say the group might be right. And in the action phase, I am aware that the group is wrong. And, and, and yes, I'm aware. I believe the group is wrong. I might still go along with it anyway. So in all cases, the people are going along with the wrong answer, but the difference is in why. In one case, they believe the group is right truly. They're not even aware that there's a difference. They don't know, like me getting lost. In the second case, they're aware that there's a difference, but they think, well, probably the group knows more. Maybe the group has more expertise. And in the final case, I might go along with a group, even if I know they're wrong, just because I don't want to stir things up. And the, 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 this OFC, this orbital frontal cortex, is involved in error detection, and it would make sense that that would be active if I'm, if I'm uh, perceiving a disagreement between myself and the group. Okay, conditions of conformity. We talked a little bit about these. Ash had conducted many things. So if we reduce the size of the group and put fewer members in the group, let's say there's only two people saying the wrong answer and then it's my turn, then I'm less likely to go along with the group. If the group is unanimous, I'm more likely to go along with the group, but if there's even one other person whose answer is, differs from the group, I'm less likely to conform. So it's nice to have an ally. Anonymity, we saw that if I don't have to publicly report that my view differs, if I can keep that private and confidential, then I'm more likely not to conform and more likely to respond to what I perceive. Expertise and status, like my hiking example, if I believe that the others are just better at it, they have more status, they have more expertise, then they're more likely, I'm more likely to uh, conform. I don't like the combination of expertise and status in this because we do have many differences in um, status that don't relate to expertise. For example, typically males have higher status than females, and so does that mean that females are more likely to conform? Or we also have differences based on, say, economic status, based on age, based on um, racial group. So we have a lot of status delineations and to what extent do the people in that lower status group tend to conform? And in my view, that differs from expertise. In expertise, there may be a just reason to, for me to defer. If I'm, work, if I'm talking to another expert whose expertise is in an area that differs from mine, I might have an idea, but I should defer to that expertise because theirs is greater. In the case of status, that one troubles me a little bit more, and you'll read more about this in your book. Um, and this leads us to uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to a culture. It's going to lead to a question I'm going to ask you. Um, people from inter interdependent or collectivist cultures, these are most dominant in the East Asian cultures, are more likely to conform than people from independent cultures. And that's because there's just much more emphasis socially throughout their upbringing in agreement with the group in fitting in and thinking about the needs of others before one's own needs. So that makes conformity more likely. And gender. Um, so we do have differences. Uh, women can form more, conform more in domains that are male-dominated. Sorry about that spelling there. And uh, typo, I'd say. And men can form more in female-typical domains. So when it comes to things like, you know, child care, which are, even though we have both males and females tending to child care, it typically, that's a female-dominated domain, and the men would tend to defer. And in engineering, say, even though we have both male and female engineers, um, if the woman, um, women would be more likely to defer in that area, and that's, that probably makes it really hard for people performing in opposite gender areas. So, um, the question that I have for you relates to this expertise and status that I briefly brought to your attention. Um, so, what if we did Ash's exact experiment, and this is what I want you to write down in your, this is the first comment where I want you to pause this and go write your answer down. Um, what if we conducted the ASH experiment using a female subject, but all the males were Confederates, all the Confederates were male. So picture that all the people saying one, 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 one incorrectly were male and there's a female. Is she more likely to conform? And what if we reverse that? With female, 
uh, co confederates, and the male is the one who's the subject. Is he less likely to conform? And I was not able to find that the study was conducted, which actually really surprises me. What if the difference was race rather than gender? Do we think that people would conform more if they were in a race that is s s underdogs? Um, so that's another question that I would have. I might also add questions about age. If we have a young person with a bunch of older people, would they be more likely, less likely to conform? What about a very fragile old person with more young, robust people? Would they be more likely to conform? So that's the answer, that's the question. It's asking about the status. And I want you to um, write your comment, pause this, write your comment in the voice that comment box and then continue. So I'm gonna pause, count to five, and then move on. Two, three, four, five. Um, okay, so um, you'll see in your book that um, you, you, as you read, you'll address some of the differences and you'll come across them. Um, I will share this much in terms of minorities who might want to influence the majority. And this is a little study that is described in your book. So could a minority opinion, let's say a lower status group, influence the opinion of the majority? So in this study, an ASH test was conducted and it was based on color. It took a color that was ambiguous whether it was blue or green, but most people identified it as blue. So it might have been a color like this. I don't have the actual color. So imagine that most people tend to identify this color as blue, even though it's sort of in the middle. Now, um, what we had was a majority subject with minority confederates. So everyone, picture again, ashes lineup of people, picture that they're all minority, and we get to the person who's this actual subject, and that person um, is asked the same question. And so let's say we come through the line, and this, there's all these ambiguous colors, and here comes this color, and everyone else, all the, minor, all the people in the minority group say that it's green, and this person, like most others, really thinks it's blue, but it's ambiguous. All right, um, so if it was mixed, if the Confederates all mixed, some said it's blue and some say it's green and they have mixed perspectives, then 99% of the participants of the subjects say it's blue. But if the, conf if the Confederates, all the minority people who are Confederates, um, all consistently say that it's green, then um, most of them still said, most of the subjects still said it was blue, but 8% of them stated that it was green. So that's an increase, you know, that's an eightfold increase from when they didn't hear that opinion. And even more importantly, they retained that opinion later. It's as if they shifted their own interpretation of where the line between blue and green is drawn and changed their view. So it does suggest that there's strength and solidarity, and that if a minority group wants to create an influence, they can, if the, to the extent that they can be strong and solid in their views, that's the extent to which they're going to um, be able to have a greater impact on the majority. I thought about this a little bit with, I mentioned to you last week that my daughter lives in Chicago and she's a teacher. Um, she's actually a case manager. She's in a really awkward position because she works a lot with administrators, but she's paid like a teacher. And um, they're striking and they're, call, they're calling it a a better, a good of the people, because some of the primary issues they're striking for are on behalf of the kids, like lower class sizes, librarians, social workers, and nurses in the schools. And um, so it's, and she talked a lot though about how important it was that none of them said a negative word about what they were doing. That no one should express doubt in their cause, that they had to hold together, and that that solidarity was what was the backbone of what they were doing. And so I'm not suggesting that her experience as a teacher is like the experience of being part of a minority group, but I am speaking to the importance of sticking together, and I'll address this a little bit more later when we talk about resistance. So, conformity today? To what extent do we conform today? Are we different? You know, that was, that was a while back. And a while back, people just had more respect for authority. We went through a lot of social revolutions since that time. We have the millennial generation who have their own perspective. We have the generation of people still younger who have the influence of social media. To what extent do we still conform? Does social media play a role? Or do we still go along with the group? I think, look at the hairstyle thing, you know. 
right? We think about back to high school. Did you have a hairstyle like all the others? Certainly I did. Everyone when I was in high school had their hair feathered like this, and sure enough, I did too. I look back on it and I think, good heavens, you know, how could we have ever presented ourselves like that? But we did, and you know, I conformed. Um, and of course, more hairstyles, and we see men going through the same thing and conforming with all these sort of styles. What's that called? A mullet or something like that? So, you know, we tend to conform. This is just one example, and maybe especially so during adolescence. But what I want you to answer in your next little prompt is if we conduct this experiment today, would the same thing happen? Why? Why not? What factors would influence this? Um, does social media have an influence, or um, if not social media, access to the internet? And so I want you to speculate. Um, I want you to put down your view. So once again, I'm going to ask you to pause. I'll count to five, and then I'll start again. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I hope you put your views down. And now we'll take a little bit of a look at um, a couple of simulations that were conducted today. And this first one is an autokinetic study, that, that is the first Sharif study, that was conducted at a university. So you'll see what was done, you'll get a good sense of it just by watching this little clip. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, everybody. My, my name is Stephen Goldstein. I'm with the, uh, the College of Optics, Optics and Photonics. Uh, we have a little uh, experiment that we need to, uh, 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 we're asking for your help with today. today. Basically, Basically, we're testing, we're testing the cone to rod ratio, ratio in your eyes uh, to, to, see to see the average propensity for the density uh, for the laser that we're going to shine on the wall for the average human uh, distance uh, sight test. test. So, so basically, all you need to do is very simple. I'm going to shine the laser pointer on the wall for about two or three seconds, and I need you to just tell me how far that you believe that the laser pointer has moved in your best uh, guesstimate inches. Three inches, subject two. Three to four. Three to four. Subject three. Subject three. Three inches. Three inches. Five inches. Five inches. Subject one. Subject one. Five inches. Five inches. Five inches. Five inches. Four inches. Subject one. How far do you believe it moved? Five inches. Five inches. Five inches. Six inches. Six inches. Six inches. Two inches. Two inches. Two inches. Okay everybody, okay, everybody, I'm going, I'm to, going shine to shine the dot, the dot and, I and I need you to just, just tell me how far you believe the, the dot has moved. Has moved. Subject, Subject one. one. Five or six. Five or six. Subject two. Subject two. Five. 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 Six, six, inches. six inches. Six inches. Six inches. Six inches. Subject, Subject one. Subject one. Seven inches. Seven inches. Seven inches. Eight inches. Eight inches. Seven inches. Seven inches. Eight inches. Eight inches. Eight inches. Subject, Subject one. Twelve inches. Twelve inches. Twelve inches. Eleven inches. Twelve inches. Twelve inches. Ten inches. Ten inches. Okay, so we can see that certainly young people in a challenging environment may tend to conform with the group. Um, would the same be true for you? Would the same be true for um, older people? You know, we saw a little simulation, we found it was true. These are the things we think about. We have some evidence that it may still hold true. Um, and I'll look at just one more. This one is just a little bit funny, and so I'll play it just for laughs. You saw a little bit of this in class earlier when we did our study of facial expression and the facial feedback. The gentleman in the elevator now embodied it. is a candid star. star. These folks who are entering, a man with a white shirt, 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 and you'll, and you'll see, see how this how man this in the trench <laughs> comes <laughs> out. Tries to maintain his independence. 
bit sorry for that young man. I think he's a very polite young man who learned to respect his elders and so <laughs> I think there are benefits to it, you know, to copying others then we have a, a civil society. So we don't want to go too far to the other extreme either where we all defy, so, but we should be aware of it. Um, so what are some of those problems with conformity? We saw, I think, a nice example of how conformity might help with social cohesion. But the problems are just as we're seeing here. I'd like to question the leadership on this move. Shut up, you're undermining the troops. We just go along into our own folly. And um, a couple of things that we'll come across later when we come to our chapter on groups is we'll come to a concept called groupthink, in which if we're with a group making an important decision, we tend to converge on a single solution that may not have all the options considered. And we'll talk about the bystander effect. You may fail to act to help another if you see others are present. And to illustrate this one, I'll say, um, you're on the interstate and you see a car pulled over stuck. Well, we first of all assume that there's a car phone. Um, but if no one else is helping, we must assume, well, they don't need help. And sometimes if we walk by somebody and there's a lot of crowd of people there and there's somebody maybe laying on the sidewalk, well, if nobody else stops, we tend to think, well, it must be okay then, and we don't stop either. And this was illustrated in a case of Kitty, of a woman whose name I'm forgetting right now, um, who was murdered as people looked on. Um, she was attacked and beaten, and nobody stepped in to help because everybody thought that someone else would help, and it's the bystander effect that we're all subject to. So we're going to look at a couple of little clips of videos um, uh, we're going to finish the Sharif video, and then we're going to watch another video by, I'm just kind of looking forward here so this doesn't get too long. Um, we'll finish the Sharif video that we watched earlier, and then we'll look at some dangers as presented by Phillips and Bardo. So this is the end of our little video. That All we kinds of scientific, scientific breakthroughs, breakthroughs, where we've correctly identified, identified balance patterns in nature. nature. It's also, it's also given, given rise to all kinds, all kinds of irrational superstitions, superstitions where we've where imagined, imagined patterns of relationships, relationships that have no basis, no basis in reality. In reality. Clearly, Clearly, conformity can have its advantages. It can give it can social, social life, life a convenient, convenient structure, convenient structure predictability. predictability. It allows, it allows us, us to maintain all sorts of social, social conventions, conventions like, like queuing, without, without the hassle of constant challenge and renegotiation. But it begins, but it begins to, work to work against us when we allow when we ourselves, ourselves to be tyrannized, to be tyrannized by, group by group opinion in areas, in areas where group opinion, opinion simply, simply shouldn't figure. figure. We can end we can up to huge, huge chunks, chunks, of chunks of our authentic selves, authentic selves for absolutely, absolutely no, no good reason. reason. Chunks, of, chunks autonomy, of autonomy, personal, personal desires, desires and preferences that have, that have no impact on others, valid objections on important issues. It's my contention that we give up a lot more than we know. 
pressure to pressure conform, to conform is, pervasive is pervasive and insidious. And insidious. We often, we often feel liberated when we break away, away from the majority, majority. We, realize we realize we've been subscribing, been subscribing to purely, purely because of social pressure, pressure, pressure to conform. We form, we form minority, minority communities that seem, that seem to represent, represent freedom from those pressures. We then find we then that, find that these minority communities can be right with exactly, exactly the same pressures, pressures to conform to them. To them. In a, in a 2007 study into how we assess, how we assess group, group opinion, opinion. Weaver, and Weaver and colleagues found, found that, that hearing an opinion repeated three, repeated three times by the same, by the same person, person in a group had almost, had almost exactly, exactly the same impact, same impact as hearing the same opinion, opinion expressed, expressed by three different people, people in a group. group. Weaver argues that we assess an opinion's popularity by how familiar it is to us, how many times we've heard it. And unfortunately, our brains don't always distinguish between an opinion expressed by many individuals and an opinion and an opinion merely merely repeated by the same few. We can be self-defeating in our conformity. Say we have a group of people holding opinion X. Unbeknownst to the group, half of them secretly disagree. But due, but due to the due social, social penalties, penalties they've seen, they've seen dished, dished out, out to a few individuals, individuals who have disagreed, disagree, they, keep they keep quiet. By conforming, By conforming we, add we add to the statistics, statistics of groups we don't actually, we don't actually belong, belong to, and perpetuate, and perpetuate the, idea the idea of majorities, majorities who may not, may not actually exist. exist. Imagine, Imagine if none, if none of us none conformed in that way, that way. How, that how that would change the social, social landscape. landscape. Just knowing, Just knowing about Ash's experiment, experiment makes us makes less susceptible as potential subjects in similar, similar experiments. experiments. The more the aware we are of our vulnerabilities to conform on any, on any level, the better, the better we're, we're able, able to defend against it. It's easier, it's easier to be skeptical to towards groups we don't belong to, or that we've broken, we've broken away from. from. But conformity, but conformity really, really kicks in in the groups, in the groups we, identify we identify with. To get the support, get the support and acceptance, and acceptance we might seek from those groups, we can find ourselves giving up more than we bargain for in return. Being part, Being part of a group doesn't, doesn't mean agreeing, agreeing with, every with every part, part of, that of that group. We should always, we should always feel able to voice legitimate, legitimate criticism with any group. Any group. Whether, that's Whether that's family, friends, friends social, social interest, interest groups, groups whoever. whoever. When we stop when we being, stop able, being to able to do that, we give those, we give those groups, groups status, status and authority, authority that they don't, they don't deserve. deserve. And that they and actually, that they actually don't, possess. don't possess. If a group can't handle legitimate dissent, it's not a group I want to be part of. Thinking, Thinking is, the is the first step. step. Doing, Doing is, the, is next. the next. Some people, Some people spend, spend years reading self-help, reading self-help books, books, having profound realizations, epiphanies, breakthroughs in their, in their head. head. Then, then they're sometimes, sometimes deflated, deflated to find that, with all that, all that amazing, amazing awareness, their life their doesn't, doesn't seem to change. It doesn't it change because, because despite, despite their, their insights, insights, they don't they change, change their behavior. Awareness is important, but behavior is just as crucial. Burns studies show that subjects who went against, against the group exhibited, exhibited brain, activity brain activity associated, associated with emotional, with emotional arousal. arousal. It feels it risky, feels to, risky stand to stand out, out. but as with, as most, with things, most things, the more you, the do, more you do it, the easier, the easier it feels. I think it's, I think important, it's important to push ourselves, to push ourselves in life, in life, to stretch, stretch ourselves. ourselves. If we don't, if we don't expect much from ourselves, we can stagnate. But expectations need to be realistic. Our own, our own expectations and, and other people's, other people's expectations, expectations of us. Disappointing, disappointing people, people can actually, can actually be, very be very humanizing. It can give, it can those, give we those we disappoint the opportunity to realize, to realize that, their that their demands might not, might be, reasonable. not be reasonable. So I'm throwing, so I'm throwing up, up an invitation, up an invitation to, consider to consider some of the things we can, we can see about ourselves, about ourselves in order to, in order to conform. conform. Preferences, preferences activities, activities, beliefs, beliefs physical, physical characteristics, characteristics that violate no one. But for some, but for some reason, reason, we submit to a perceived consensus, consensus that, they that they are unacceptable. What kinds what of fears, fears lie behind, behind conformity our conformity in these things? Are these just, are these just rational? You don't like, you don't to, like dance? to dance? Don't dance. Don't dance. The, ideas, the ideas, the books, the, books, the, films, the films, the people, the people that, inspire that inspire me are the ones, are the ones that, celebrate that celebrate diversity, diversity individuality, individuality, authenticity. authenticity. I've certainly, I've certainly never been inspired, been inspired by anyone who's encouraged conformity to the group. Anyone who's, anyone who's trying to encourage fear or, or trying to shrink my, shrink my comfort zone. zone. People who People come, who out, come with out with this kind of fallacious bullshit. bullshit. Have, you? Have you? I say, I say question, question this stuff. stuff. Question, question the, group. the group. And let's and risk, risk being, being more fully, fully ourselves. ourselves. And I found this to be a really nice little video, even though it was just a blue PowerPoint. I really thought that he captured some key ideas about expressing yourself in times when it's appropriate not to conform. Um, now, I'm going to jump into, um, oh boy, I managed to get us out of our place here. Um, so I have one more little piece that I want to show you related to this problems with conformity, and I'm going to actually show it at the end, but I do think it's worth watching. Um, and it, it says Zimbardo talking about these studies and offering us some other examples of when these apply. So a little bit more though, um, how and when and what situations do we give in to others? 
And so um, the norm of reciprocity is this idea that if someone does you a favor, you're more likely to help them out in the future. So the door, um, we have three mechanisms that your book talks about with this. Um, and you can imagine that if someone helps you push your car out of the way and says, oh my gosh, I'm thirsty, do you have an extra water bottle? You're more likely to give them a water bottle than if the person just approaches you without first helping you fix, uh, push your car out of the road or something like that. But there are three ways that we can use or that others might use these techniques to manipulate us. And one is the door in your face technique, which um, we will let the video describe. But in essence, it's like um, someone, you, someone asks you for something that's so big that there's no way you're going to do it. And so then most people refuse, and so then they drop it to something smaller, and then you comply, whereas you might not in, the few, in another situation. And let's just start right there with this little video. Four minutes is a better description than I think I can do with PowerPoints. Have you ever, Have been, you ever to been to the mall or a shopping, shopping center, center and you see, and you those, see carts those carts with the very, with the very aggressive, aggressive salespeople? As you, As you walk by, by they'll, scream, they'll scream, excuse me, excuse sir, me, sir or, ma or ma could I ask, could you, I a ask you a question? Now, you're now generally, you're generally the, kind the kind of person who allows other people, other people to ask them a question. question. So you say, so you sure. Say sure. And they'll ask and they'll you something, ask something like, like, how do you think you would look at your extension? Or, have you ever thought about buying a timeshare? And they got you. This is this known, is as, known the as the foot in the door, in the door technique, technique, and it works and extremely, extremely well. well. Basically, Basically, the way it works, way it works is somebody will ask you for a small favor, favor or a small, or a small request, request, and then subsequently and then ask, ask you for a you larger for a favor, favor or a larger request. Larger request. And, and if, if you agree to the first, first smaller request or favor, you will be more likely to comply with their larger request later on. In 1966, two researchers, Jonathan Friedman and Scott Fraser, decided, decided to, to test, test this technique, technique to see if it was real and there was some real science, science behind, it. behind it. In experiment, in experiment one, one, the researchers contacted 156 women, women who were at who home, home during the work day. Work day. They, they divided this group this of 156, 156 women into four, into four smaller, smaller groups, groups, three of, three of which they called, they called by, telephone by telephone and asked a question. The question was, can you tell me what kind of products you're using, what kind of household products, soaps and so forth? They made note of those who complied, who complied and thanked them, thanked for, their them time. for their time. Now, three, now, days, three later, days later, the researchers, the researchers called, upon called upon the same three groups, groups of women, of women plus, plus the fourth, the fourth group, group with whom they had, they no, had contact no contact up until this point. This point. This time, this time they, asked they asked a very, a very different, different question. question. They asked they a pretty asked large, large request. request. They asked, they asked the, women the women if it was okay, it was okay if they could they send could somebody, somebody to, their, to homes their homes during the during day, day to have them have catalog, them catalog what, kind what kind of products they use. They use. Basically, Basically ransack their, their kitchen cabinets. cabinets. And here's, and what, here's the what the researchers found. found. Out, of the, Out of the first three, three groups, groups that were asked, that were asked a smaller, smaller request, 52.8% of those women agreed to let a complete stranger in their home to go through their cabinets and catalog the different products they're using. Now, this fourth group of women, with whom the researchers had no contact up until this point, only 22.2% of these women agreed to the larger request, and that was to let somebody in their house to go through their cabinets. There was a significant difference between these two groups, showing that asking a small favor at first First, certainly, certainly paves the way, the way for, agreement for agreement for a much, for a much larger, larger favor, favor later, on. later on. In experiment, In experiment number, two, number two, the researchers, the researchers decided, decided to change it up. Change it up. This time, this they, time contacted they contacted 112 men and women. And women. Seven, Seven men were men actually, were actually home, at home at the time, so they included them in the study as well. Like the first like study, study, they took they this took group this of 112, 112 men and women and, women and divided, and them, divided into them into four different, different groups. groups. They, went they went to the homes, to the homes of, the of the first three groups, three groups of, subjects, of subjects, knocked on knocked the door, door and, asked and asked them if they would, if be, they would so be so kind as to put, as to put a, a small sign in their window, in their window or in the window, window of their of car, car that either that promoted, promoted safe driving or keeping California clean. About two About weeks two later, later, the researchers, researchers went, back went back to the first, to the first three groups, plus the fourth, the fourth group, group with whom they had no contact, no contact, and they asked, and they asked a large, a large request. request. They asked they them asked to, them put, to a put a large, large pretty unattractive, unattractive billboard, billboard in their, in their yard, yard, promoting, promoting either, either safe, safe driving, driving or keeping or California beautiful. beautiful. Now, the researchers, now the researchers wanted, wanted to know if it was the message, was the message itself, itself that was that influencing, influencing the participants, the participants to, put to put the larger billboard, billboard in their in yard. yard. So, for example, so for example if, if the participants, the participants at, first at first agreed to a small to a sign, sign about, about traffic, traffic safety, safety, would it matter, would it matter if, they if they were asked to put a large billboard about keeping California, California beautiful? beautiful? 
and they found, and they found that, that no, it did, it did not. not. There was, there no, was difference no difference whatsoever. whatsoever. So it so wasn't, it wasn't about, about, about the message. message. It was about, it was about complying. complying. The researchers, the researchers finally, finally concluded, concluded that what, that was, what going was going on was a change, was a change in, the in the person's feelings, feelings about, becoming about becoming the kind of person, person who actually who complies, complies with, with these kind of requests. requests. Once, the Once the person agreed, agreed to a small, to a small request, request, they had a, they they had a new self-image. Self they, they, they had the self-image of, of being the kind, kind of person that agrees with these kind of requests. This technique has implications in many areas of life, specifically sales, marketing, and even politics. Now that now you are, that you aware, are aware of this technique, of this technique you could be, be more vigilant, vigilant when somebody, when somebody tries, tries to use this, use this technique, technique on you. On you. The, next the next time you're walking, you're walking through, the mall, through the mall and somebody, and somebody says, excuse, excuse me, me, sir, ma'am, ma can I ask can you I a ask question? You a question? Just, just smile, smile keep, walking, keep walking, look at them, look at them and, them say, and say, you just you did. Just did. Okay. Um, so, um, I thought that was a better description than I could give, so we hear it from him. But you can get how you might be taken in by that. And let me zoom forward again to that point. Okay. And so that's the door in your face technique. Um, we have two other techniques that you should know about. Um, though that's not all technique we've all been subject to. Um, it worked like this initially. Someone, a Girl Scout, might come up and say, oh, I'm selling brownies. They're 75 cents. And then they pause, and you get accustomed yourself to the idea that it's 75 cents. And they add, and it comes with two cookies. And at that point, you're much more likely to buy than if they had said it right up front, um, it's 75 cents for a brownie and two cookies. So it's a, it's a funny little mechanism. Um, and the suggestion, uh, the suggestion that it's reciprocity, meaning you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, relates to the possibility that um, you are perceiving that addition of the two cookies as the seller doing you a favor. Um, and so then there comes in the reciprocity influence. I would suggest that that's not the reason that, in fact, it's just that, oh, you were, you were, gonna, you were just about ready to pay 75 cents for just the brownie, and now you're getting two cookies as well while well, you're all the more persuaded. And finally, the foot in the door technique will seem to you the reverse of the door in your face technique, because what it is is the, um, you, you just get the person accustomed to you by you just get your foot in the door by asking for a teeny thing. And then, you raise that to something larger. And so the example here, and I don't think, I wonder if I gave you the wrong example. I had to step out during this video. Um, so the foot in the door is the billboard one. I think he just talked to you about that. Um, so the billboard one, um, you're, the people are coming up to you and, and knocking on your door, and in group A they said, will you, will you put this big giant billboard in your yard promoting safe traffic? Only 17% complied. With group B, um, the participants were asked simply, will you put this small sign in your window um, of your car? And it just says, be safe when you're driving. And 98% said, sure, I can put a small sign in my window. Well, then when they went back to those same people and the same, same, <coughs> the same salesperson went back to the same people a couple of weeks later and said, Afterwards, now will you put this big billboard in your yard, 76% complied. And I think I might have had that mislabeled. So that's the foot in the door technique, and that becomes part of their identity. The door in your face technique is the opposite. You start out asking for something really huge, and then you reduce it. And in this case, um, in group A, people were simply asked, um, can you help chaperone a group of juvenile delinquents on a trip to the zoo? And 83% said no. And group B was asked, could you spare two hours a week for two years to counsel juvenile delinquents? And almost everyone said no. But then if you ask that same people right after they said no, you say, well, could you help us chaperone, could you help chaperone a group of juvenile delinquents on a trip to the zoo? Then half of them said yes. So when they had to decline that first favor, they were more likely to accept the smaller favor, whereas if they had just been asked that smaller favor in the first place, they wouldn't have accepted. So you can see how both of these mechanisms come into play. Um, the other video I'm not going to show you that says combined is what if we combine these techniques? So let's get our foot in the door by just asking a friendly inquiry. Let's ask about their health. Hello, um, are you feeling well today? How are you feeling today? And that's the foot in the door. And then let's ask for the big request. Would you be willing to donate $100 to support um, uh, the group supporting juvenile delinquents? And most people say, no, 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 I don't have that kind of money. And just as they're walking away, you say, well, okay, I understand, but could you offer $10? 
and then they're much more likely to say yes um, after having had to decline you for a bigger effect, a bigger amount. So I hope these make sense to you. You're asked to work with these a little bit in your prep this week. Okay, um, so compliance emotion um, is, um, first these were considered reason-based approaches, like doing it based on your reasoning, and so these are norms of reciprocity. The second mechanism of compliance is to get you based on your heart, emotion-based approaches. Um, so are you more likely, if someone comes and asks you for a donation, are you more likely to give when you're in a good mood or a bad mood? You'll read about this in your book, but very often if you're in a good mood, you're, you're likely to agree. And why? Because first off, you just might have a happier lens on your face and you're likely to interpret the events positively. And you also might want to do things that help you maintain that good mood. So if, you're, if you donate, then you're still going to feel good about yourself and life will be happy. What about if you're in a bad mood? Is there any sort of bad mood that might make you more likely to comply? So most often you're not necessarily more likely to comply if you're in a bad mood. You're more likely if you're in a good mood. Okay, but some bad moods will increase compliance, and guilt is one of those mechanisms. So if you're feeling really guilty about something, like let's say you, um, you've been really grouchy for about two weeks, and you know you love your partner, your spouse, but you've been really grouchy, and they ask you to do them a favor, would you run this over to the post office and mail it for me? You're more likely to comply because maybe you feel guilty. And this was exemplified in the research. People were more likely to donate when they were entering the confessional than when they were exiting and they felt absolved. On a full stomach, this was an interesting example. Judges are harsher on defendants who are the last ones before lunch and more lenient on defendants who come up after lunch. And one hypothesis is that it might relieve that negative state if you help someone else. And research supports this, that helping someone else does help relieve a negative state. So those are emotion-based approaches. And then finally, we have norm-based approaches. So this is um, to agreeing to things because you know that most people do it. And in fact, just telling people what others are doing will change their behavior in some cases. Um, your book has some very nice examples um, that you should read and become familiar with. Um, and so if you're presented with accurate facts, let's say um, you found a sign on your door from the power company and it shows the energy consumption of your home and the home of your neighbors, um, would you change your energy consumption in any way? And in most cases, those, if you found out that you were using more than average, you're more likely to decrease consumption. But what about those who are lower than average? Will they increase their consumption? And in fact, they would. And that's not good. We don't really want that. But how can we change that? Well, if we just put a little smiley face on their home compared to sad faces on other homes, they're likely to change their consumption. Um, and just a moment here, because now the door, this is one good reason that it's nice to come to campus. Um, all right, um, so pluralistic ignorance, um, sometimes these conforming beliefs can lead others to change their behavior. For instance, a lot of people believe that other teenagers are sexually active by the age of 15, and if that's the case, they are more likely to um, engage in that themselves, but it's a false belief, and that's pluralistic ignorance, and if that's the case, um, this is a study that I described right from your book, and it shows that we tend to misjudge. In this case, these are students who are presented, um, who are asked, how comfortable are you with alcohol, and the bars down here present how, how comfortable they are with alcohol, how comfortable they think their friends are with alcohol, and how comfortable they think others are with alcohol. But you can see that consistently they, re they related their own comfort with alcohol as less than others, but that this is a distortion. It's pluralistic ignorance or misperception. Um, prescriptive norms are those that tell others what they think they should do, trying to induce behavior. And it's best in cases like that to be consistent with the norm the example here is um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't point out that the norm is different from what you're being asked to do. So if we tell you, trying to get you to not text and drive, we try a prescriptive norm, don't text and drive, you shouldn't. People shouldn't text and drive. We say too many people do it. Well, there we have set up a conflict. We've given you a prescription, we shouldn't text and drive, and at the same time we've said, but the norm says most people text and drive. Instead, we should say, most people make the decision to pull over when they need to 
to enter a text. Okay. And we should use a norm that's as specific as possible. Instead of saying most people, we should say most UA students, if that's the group we're trying to persuade. So we should tap that in group. And the final thing I talked to you about here today is resisting influence. So now that we know that others try to influence you, what are you going to do about not being influenced when you don't want to be? Um, so reactance theory is the theory that describes what caused people to do this. Um, you might ask, if someone says no, are you more or less inclined to want to do it? Think back to when your parents told you not to get your ears pierced or something like that. The theory says that you will be more inclined to do it if someone is pushing you against it. So let's say you decide you want to resist. You know, you decide you're going to get your ears pierced, you're going to get that new hairdo anyhow. How can you hold strong? Well, I would first offer that check your reasons. Make sure that you're doing it for the right reason, not just because you're rebelling, all right? And an example might be feeling that I can't instead of I won't. Um, I can't do that. Is a stronger statement of commitment and appropriate motivation than I won't. But um, you also have the uh, experience. If you have resisted things in the past, you will be better at resisting in the future. Get an ally. Um, if you can have someone else on your side, it will be easier to stand up. And delay. Don't get, don't, if, if you're pushed on, on an issue and you want to keep resisting, then don't, don't take any action at the time when you're emotional. Let things play out. When we come to class uh, not this com not, uh, on the 7th, we will apply these examples to what's happening in Hong Kong, to what happens, hopefully happened by that point in Chicago, and I'll also read through your own examples. You have yet to do one more assignment. It is to watch this video that's available in the library. It's about a study you'll be familiar with, the Milgram Experiments, but it actually goes to very good footage um, from the original experiment. You'll have a lot more detail, and we will be discussing this in class. All right. You can think about would you have obeyed? Does the era make a difference? And these are questions that you'll be discussing in your prep. So for your assignment, you'll be completing the prep. You'll have responded to the two questions in the voice thread. Um, you'll watch this video on obedience, um, and I will show the last video that I mentioned in class. It's about nine minutes long, and we'll show that and talk about it in class when we next meet. All right, everybody, enjoy your Halloween and your weekend, and we'll see you back in another week.